Okay, we are recording. So. All right, great. So, yeah, I'm Greg Simmons. Uh, I'm one of the assistant directors in the city's transportation and public works department. And the stormwater management program is one of my areas of responsibility. And so uh, we're uh, appreciate y'all joining us tonight. It's always a pleasure to get together with the Arlington Heights community. Pretty much unmatched for you know passion for the community, and it's always impressive and inspiring. Um, you know, I wish that my interactions over the years, you know, generally would have been on a more positive topic. But you know, we've got a really challenging situation uh, relative to the drainage issues in the Central Arlington Heights neighborhood. I've been personally engaged on this issue for 16 years now. And um, I don't know how many public meetings, formal, how many informal meetings and conversations, I, they would be countless at this point, but all of that speaks to just the fact that it's an extremely challenging situation to try and address all the needs. And so uh, we're, we're working really hard to try and um, uh, satisfy as much as possible the different uh, factions here, basically, but, you know, in some cases, we've got some mutually exclusive challenges and that's what makes it so difficult. And so, you know, we want to, we want to listen again and hear from y'all and to the Wilhelm's point, we do have some background information just to refresh everybody on how we got to where we are, uh, just to help you get a little appreciation for the broader context again, and some of the challenges that we're dealing with. As you see on the screen, you know, we do want to have interaction here. We, we know and realize that this sort of thing, as complicated as it is, can bring up lots and lots of questions and there's lots of directions we can go and we want to uh, try and maintain as much as we can, you know, about an hour meeting here. So we won't, we may not be able to go into to all the questions, but we'll try as as much as we can to address the ones that have a pretty straightforward answer. And then we'll figure out the best way to respond uh, to the other ones. But uh, again, one of the things we've committed to throughout this process is keeping the community up to date on what's going on and making sure that there was uh, plenty of opportunities to hear your feedback. And so that's kind of what tonight is all about. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to Jennifer Dyke to take you through the presentation. Okay, thank you, Greg. Thank you everyone for being here with us tonight. I'm gonna see if I can click us forward. Okay, so uh, so today we're gonna go through again, like Greg said, we're gonna go through a background. Um, so it's a, it is a little bit lengthy, but I really want to make sure that everyone uh, who's new to the neighborhood um, has a good understanding of how we got to be where we're at today, um, what properties that we've actually acquired so far, and then what remains. What our plan is regarding selling the properties uh, to a developer for redevelopment and what we're going to be calling a notice of sale. And then we'll talk about our open space use plan for the 2 properties that we're acquiring with FEMA grant funding, which is a historic mitigation requirement. So the flooding problem in the central Arlington Heights area is really the same problem experienced in many other neighborhoods across the city of Fort Worth and really cities nation nationwide. Um, so before the city started to develop, the area was drained by natural creeks and swales that took the stormwater to the Trinity River. And as the area began to develop to make it easier to build, uh, many natural creeks and swales were converted into storm drain pipes and then structures that were built on top of or around the drainage pipes. So the, uh, the screenshot that you see here are some plans from 1924 showing that natural creek that used to be um, in Arlington Heights area in blue. And then it shows the new proposed drainage pipe in red. Um, so the drainage pipe was going was put in to convey that water instead of the creek. So the problem is, is that um, oftentimes the drainage pipes that were constructed weren't large enough to convey all the stormwater runoff that is um, in the area today. There's probably several reasons for that. Uh, back then, I'm sure they had different standards and expectations. They probably didn't anticipate future development and all the impervious cover that we have today. People's lifestyles might have been less vulnerable to flood damage. And then there's the, the argument of climate change. So, um, so the flooding um, in Arlington Heights has been going on for many years. And it was actually identified in the city's 1967 drainage master plan. Um, so while we've been keep, keeping pretty good track of reported flooding in the area since 2004, we're pretty certain that the flooding was 
um, has been pretty significant and there, there's a lot of flooding that we don't know about for this part of town to actually be identified in the city's 1967 plan. So the map on this slide here shows the three drainage areas that make up the Arlington Heights community. So on the left, you've got Western in the middle central and then on the right, Eastern Arlington Heights. So each area drains from the Northwest to the Southeast into the Trinity River through systems mainly comprised of undersized storm drain pipes. So the blue areas on the map represent the approximate flood risk along the red drainage pipes. And so where you see the darker, uh, the darker shades of blue is where the water is deeper. And then the photos that you see on the screen are some of the past uh, flooding that has been experienced in, in that area in green. So the, these blocks of Western and Carlton, which is what we call ground zero. And that's the focus of tonight's meeting. So to mitigate the flooding throughout Arlington Heights, we really would have to get the water all the way to the Trinity, which as you can see here really isn't easy. You've got the giant highway I-30 through the middle of the drainage area. You've got the Union Pacific Railroad. And then of course you've got lots and lots of development. Um, so so we, when we move the water, we have to move it to a place where there is an adequate outfall. So there's gotta be place to take that water without causing flooding on someone else. So what's been done uh, so far? So there was a really large flood event in 2004 and that actually helped uh, create the city of Fort Worth stormwater utility. And the rain event um, had significant flooding in the central Arlington Heights area. And since that time, the city of Fort Worth has been working with various consulting companies. Uh, Frisa Nichols, who is on the call today, is one of the main ones uh, who's been working with us really to help us understand what the flood risk is out there and trying to um, look at ways to mitigate that risk and, and do that engineering evaluation. So the city's invested over a million dollars and is in evaluating the flood risk in the central Arlington Heights area. We've done uh, benchmarking of what other communities have done to mitigate similar types of flooding. We've held multiple public and community meetings, um, all trying to work towards identifying an effective, affordable and acceptable flood mitigation measure without moving the flooding to another area. Um, so the only, the affordable measures that we've identified really only provide a small amount of relief in the most frequent rain events. And so that's basically no relief for the 100 year event. So the concepts shown on the screen just show a couple of the measures that we have looked, uh, looked at as a part of the engineering evaluation. So we've looked at storm drain improvements, we've looked at um, big tunneling, we've looked at surface and underground detention basins, we've looked at property buyout in varying numbers of homes and locations, and then we've also looked at more greener methods of mitigation like bioswales and, and rain gardens. So based on what um, all the evaluation has shown, the city has done several projects to mitigate flooding um, as much as practically feasible. So between 2016 or 2012 and 2016, we designed and um, constructed surface detention at Hewlin and Bryce, so right across from the Walgreens. I'm sure y'all are familiar with that basin. We purchased three commercial lots and, and put that basin in. And then we also put in big um, underground boxes under the street on Bryce, Western, and Ashland. Uh, so together, those provide around five and a half acre feet of detention storage. So just kind of so you understand what five and a half acre feet really is, um, it would equate to around 12 Central Arlington sized residential lots to detain stormwater two feet deep. So that's a little over half a block on one side of the street holding two feet of water. And so another way that I kind of like to explain it is um, a foot off over an acre. And so one acre foot of water is roughly equivalent to one foot of water across a football field. Um, so here we've kind of created a football field with five and a half feet of water sitting on top of it. That's how much water is um, that the basin can hold. And you can see in this photo um, from 2017 and, and many other times uh, since then, the basin does fill up. Um, and, and the community downstream has said that that um, all of these I put in um, have been effective but it's it's just a little bit um, and there's a lot of storm water. So, um, so for comparison purposes, uh, I reached out to Frisa Nichols uh, because they've been doing this for a long time and, and they did remind me that we had looked at how much actually acre feet 
um, of storage would be needed to mitigate the 100 year event in this area. And that's around 60 residential properties that would be converted into four multi use basins around 15 feet deep. And so those um, basins would be around 130 acre feet. So just for comparison purposes, um, we've got five and a half acre feet, but we would need 130 acre feet um, to really store the amount of stormwater running through this area. And we're gonna hold questions until the end. So like, that's totally fine that you have your hand up, but I just wanna let you know that, so. Okay, so. Uh, so once we put these in, um, the basin and the underground uh, detention were in, in June 27, 2016, um, the rain event dropped around three inches in one hour in the Arlington Heights area, which is around a 25 year storm. And that storm has around a 4% chance of happening in any given year in any given location. And so even with the basin and the understreet detention in place, home flooding still happened as shown in this photo on Western Avenue. So in conclusion, after 12 years of intensive evaluation, uh, the city determined that there really isn't an effective, affordable, and acceptable solution to mitigate the flooding in Arlington Heights. So out of all the measures evaluated, property acquisition was identified as the most effective and affordable solution, but it did not meet the goal of community consensus and acceptability. So the city though felt the voluntary buyout would provide relief to residents most at risk and that the flood risk was urgent enough to move forward without community consensus. And so voluntary buyout provides 100% flood mitigation to the properties that are bought out. So they will no longer flood again because they're gone. Um, and then it also would give us an opportunity to use the properties that were bought out to put in stormwater detention to mitigate for residents downstream. But as I've said, it's just a little bit of detention that would be possible uh, from buyout. So the detention can also serve as a green recreational um, area for the community. Um, it's done in other areas across the country. So with that, the city began applying for grant funding for voluntary buyout in 2017. We applied for several grants and we received one from FEMA in 2018. And then we held a public meeting in October, 2018 to discuss the city's plan to move forward with voluntary buyout. And due to the community concerns expressed in that meeting, the city decided to pursue selling the properties that we have acquired through voluntary acquisition for redevelopment instead of creating the green space um, detention basin concept. So where are we at today? So after that October 2018 public meeting, we began the process of acquiring the property with the main purpose of mitigating the flood risk to those most flood prone homes. So that ground zero area that was circled on the map. And so again, the buyout itself really does uh, nothing to mitigate flood risk to other residents unless we were able to put detention and that's uh, just a small amount of uh, mitigation. So nine properties on Western and Carlton have been acquired uh, between the summer of 2019 and the summer of 2020. Uh, with a cost of around $3.8 million. And so these properties are shown in um, blue on the screen. <clears throat> and so the map shows uh, also the 100 year flood risk that Friesen Nichols has mapped for this area. And so just kind of so y'all understand the 100 year flood risk has around a 26% chance of occurring over a 30 year mortgage. So lots of people, when they buy their home, they get a 30 year mortgage. Uh, so you've got a 26% chance if you live in one of these areas uh, of actually flooding from the 100 year event. So the two green hatched properties on Western are the properties that we're acquiring with the grant funding. And so the city council will be asked to approve the purchase of these two homes on May 24th. And the grant covers $550,000 out of a total acquisition cost of $667,000 for these properties. And so the grant stipulates that the structures um, have to be demolished within 90 days of closing and the property remain green space in perpetuity because the whole purpose of the grant from FEMA is to mitigate continued com claims on the National Flood Insurance uh, Program and restore natural floodplain functions to property that should never have been developed. Um, so I will say that we have been asked, instead of just demolishing the two FEMA homes, 
could we possibly uh, sell them to somebody to move them somewhere else um, or salvage them so they don't all end up in the landfill? And that is something that we have reached out to uh, FEMA to see if that is uh, acceptable under the grant. So we're still um, there. They've asked some follow-up questions, so we're still waiting from them, but we're looking into that possibility. So now I'm talking about the notice of sale. So as mentioned earlier, uh, based on the community's concerns about creating a green space and detention basin out of the properties we voluntarily acquire, we've been working on developing a notice of sale to sell these properties uh, to a developer for redevelopment that complies with very specific guidelines and conditions. So we're planning to finalize the notice of sale in June and issue it this summer after considering feedback uh, really focusing on the residents um, that live on, on Western and Carlton closest to these properties. So we plan to issue the notice of sale for 60 days. We really want to ensure that there's enough time for developers to really think about this. Um, this is a unique type of project. Um, and so while the notice for sale is open, we'll have a pre-bid meeting. There'll also be an opportunity for developers to go out and to visit these sites so they can really understand what's going on. Um, to put together a better proposal. We're planning to share the notice of sale with the Fort Worth development community um, and over 100 historic preservation community contacts in the hopes to identify a valuable bidder. And we're also going to be seeking input from local residential real estate professionals on the best way to get the word out about this opportunity. So while the city will reserve the right to reject any bidder, the whole purpose of the notice of sale is to identify a viable bidder. Um, and the hope is to complete the sale of the property by the end of the year. So, however, if we don't identify a viable bidder, the city would fall back on the green space and detention basin concept, and we would work closely with the community on the design of this area. So I wanted to go over just a few of the key features about the notice of sale. And after to tonight's meeting, I will send out the draft notice of sale documents with a link to the meeting recording. So y'all can take a look at that and anyone who's missed the meeting uh, can see it as well. So, um, so the first requirement of the notice for sale is that the developer has to buy all properties. Uh, because the project is very unique and complex, we really just want one developer to coordinate with. So we don't wanna sell each lot to an individual developer or resident or try to sell the lots on Carlton separately from the ones on Western. We're really trying to ensure a very coordinated approach to the redevelopment project. Um, so we have received multiple requests from community representatives that we allow sales to multiple developers. And we feel like this is um, already gonna be a very challenging process. And so really to be managed most effectively, um, that's why we're looking at one developer. We really feel like that multi multiple developers will make this project even harder than we think it's already gonna be. So the two FEMA grant properties um, are a, that were shown in green on that last slide, they will not be a part of the notice for sale. Uh, those will stay city owned. So we coordinated with FEMA and FEMA does not allow those properties to be sold per federal code. So they have to remain owned by a public entity or a qualified conservation organization. So that's why we can't include those uh, within that. So, however, there's the potential that if, if the homes on either side of those lots is redeveloped in the future, that those property owners could use those as yard space and, and we could have an agreement with them so people could use them and maintain them um, just like part of their yard, as long as they're in compliance with the, uh, the uses allowed on FEMA property. And I'm going to go over those in a few minutes. So, also... Uh, the best value method will be used to select the developer. And so I'll talk about that actually a little bit more in another slide. The notice of sale will also stipulate a minimal, a minimum acceptable bid. And so we are going to start an appraisal very soon to determine the value of the property, taking into account the restrictions being imposed on, on the developer. So we really expect the value of the properties to be much less than what we purchased them for uh, a few slides back. So our city appraisal uh, was done to make the property owners whole that were experiencing the flooding. And so it did not take flood risk into account uh, when those properties were valued in the past, while the appraisal that we are about to do will take the flood risk into account as well as all of the development restrictions. So the restrictions that will be placed on the property 
will reduce the profitability of the redevelopment um, to prospective bidders. So we really want to make sure that that appraisal is as accurate as possible um, so they can understand that when bidding on the properties. A developer must complete all requirements, um, all of the uh, redevelopment within 30 months of actually closing. So we're hoping we can sell these by the end of the year. So within 30 months, we hope that they would have everything redeveloped. Um, the developer, if they fail to meet that option, or if they fail to meet the 30 months, we do have the option to buy the properties back. Um, but we're really hoping that they're successful and we're gonna work with them uh, to make them successful. Uh, so another big piece of it is that newer elevated homes must be at least two feet above the flood level and comply with other um, stormwater and city of Fort Worth regulations. So elevating or flood proofing at least two feet above the flood risk is a city of Fort Worth requirement for all development in flood prone areas. So based on the flood levels and the two foot requirements, if the existing homes are elevated, they will be around a little over three to around four and, a five, four and a half feet higher than the current finished floor elevation of the homes. And so we've actually got a couple um, homes shown on the slide and one of the residents went out there and marked uh, lines on the home. And so if you go out in the field on Carlton right now, you will see those lines. I stuck a, a red bar over the lines just because it showed up better on the PowerPoint. Um, but I want to thank him for doing that. And we actually sent Freesa Nichols out to confirm. I uh, didn't want people to go by and, and look at the line and, and it be wrong, uh, but he did a really good job. The line was pretty good. Um, so thank you, Jim, if you're on the call. Um, and then also this bottom photo just shows an example of how the elevation could be done. So we the homes need to have skirting fully around it. So it's not like they're just like stuck out there on piers, like when you go to Galveston and you see those homes where people can drive underneath and so forth. Um, but really we need that skirting around there um, too as a flood mitigation effort because the water right now hits those uh, current homes and we want that water to continue to slow down and hit those homes to make sure people downstream aren't flooding. Um, let's see, also we um, part of the notice of sale is we really wanna make sure that um, future purchasers or renters of these properties understand the flood risk. And so there's going to be a disclosure form that they have to sign to really make sure they understand. So we don't want anyone to be surprised that even though the homes are elevated, properties are still gonna flood, people's vehicles could get damaged, their fences could be knocked over, their landscaping could be ripped up. So we just wanna make sure that people are aware that that risk is gonna continue. Um, and then lastly, of course, um, pretty important for the rest of the neighborhood is that the developer needs to protect the downstream and adjacent properties during the redevelopment. And I have another slide um, in a couple of minutes to talk about that in a little bit more detail. So based on the feedback we received from the Arlington Heights leadership and the residents, we put together guidelines for redevelopment of the homes and we modeled these after the historic Fairmount guidelines. So uh, we really, the whole purpose of the feedback we received was we wanted, or the neighborhood wanted the new structures to really harmonize with the existing structures. And so we have um, pretty specific guidelines on the height and the width, setbacks, building form, site configuration and materials. That's just a few. And when I send out the draft documents, y'all will be able to see that. Uh, the developer's plans will be reviewed for compliance with guidelines and conformance with all city of Fort Worth development standards before building permits are issued. And the concepts on the slide here just kind of show some of those graphics that are in um, the, the design guidelines that you'll see. So uh, the one on the left trying to show that we wanna maintain a consistent building line. The one in the middle is just trying to show kind of the look and the feel of the homes. The one on the right is showing that the garages would be back in the back and not up on the front of the properties. Um, so the restrictions in the notice for sale are the only requirements that, be, that are being placed on the bidders relative to the final product that are above and beyond existing requirements. And these are based on, again, the feedback that we've received from the community. <coughs> so as mentioned earlier, uh, said the developer must protect, protect downstream and adjacent properties during redevelopment. So what they'll have to do is they have to demonstrate that they aren't aggravating that existing flood risk. The city will be reviewing ultimate and interim development plans for compliance with city standards. And so 
Uh, we typically don't review interim development plans, but because of the flood risk in this area, we wanted to add that to our review to really make sure that the risk is considered during the development process and not just for the final build. The developer will be required to maintain the existing fences around the sides and the backs of the properties. Since the fences really do control the flow of stormwater in the area and removing them could increase the risk of flooding to others. So if the developer maintains the flow paths around the homes, they maintain or offset new impervious cover and they don't significantly change the grading, they can develop in a way that doesn't aggregate, aggravate flooding to others. <clears throat> I'll also note um, that we've been asked if we could require a developer to add larger pipes or detention or bioswales to a part of their development. Um, but we did not put that as a requirement in the notice of sale because as I said earlier, the benefits are just so, so small. And we already knew that this was gonna be a very complex project. And so we wanted to not have that as a requirement. Okay, so how are we going to select the best bidder? Um, so as I said earlier, we're gonna use this best value selection process. Um, so that means we're considering more than, more than just price when we look at the bids. So uh, the best value bidder will get the most points. So one is we will look and they'll get points for the highest bid. And then also based on the feedback from the neighborhood association um, for a preference to see the existing homes elevated versus tear down and new build, we have given um, elevation for the four most significant homes, these four homes shown on the slide, these are ones that we've received feedback from the neighborhood that these were kind of more special than other homes. And so we have given them points if they choose to elevate these homes instead of um, tear them down and rebuild. Also, um, there's going to be a community preference checklist that has other topics um, the community said was important, but they're not requirements. So tree preservation, the bioswales, permeable pavement, rain barrels, and elevation in accordance with Secretary of the Interior Standards. And so we will actually work with the leadership to form a community group that will help us. They will evaluate the bids, really focusing on the community preferences the developer is willing to accommodate. And they will rank each bid from poor to exceptional. And the city will then assign points based on the community score. So, so y'all will help us um, review these bids that way. So we'll work with the Arlington Heights leadership uh, to form that group, really, we hope that the majority of the group um, are residents on those impacted blocks of Western and Carleton. Okay, we're almost there. Okay, so the open space use plan. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, FEMA requires the city to perform historic mitigation for the demolition of the two homes shown on this slide uh, due to our grant funding. And so part of the mitigation is to create an open space use plan for these properties and how they'll be used and maintained after the purchase and demolition while complying with FEMA specific guidelines for allowable uses. So in general, there's really little that we can do with these properties um, other than just keep them undeveloped to not make any flooding worse. And so the draft plan that we've created that I'll show in a second, um, we really focused on the community feedback that we've received so far uh, in the past, we were really told that the neighborhood doesn't want these sites to be turned into a community gathering area. Um, Y'all didn't want it to attract unwanted uses or visitors. Um, and then you wanted the ability for those future residents next to them to be able to use the yards. So, uh, so we really want to get your feedback tonight or within the next week on the concept that we put together. So then we can take that feedback and begin our historic consultation process and work towards finalizing the plan. So the groups on the screen are part of the historic consultation process. And as you will see, Christina Petkowski is representing the neighborhood and that group. So, uh, so what you see today, uh, this is the current plan with the two FEMA properties on, on each side. And then this is the open space use plan here. So it really just shows what the properties would look like after those two uh, grant funded structures are demolished. So you can see um, all the homes, the impervious surfaces are removed. Uh, the city is planning to add sprinklers and turf grass to stabilize the sites. Um, we're gonna try to save the existing trees as much as possible. The back and the side fencing will remain. As I said, that's really important um, to mitigate flooding. 
And then the city will come in and mow and maintain these property properties um, as appropriate. I know we've been mowing right now the properties and so we'll continue to mow those. And then as mentioned earlier, um, in the future, these residents on either side could have the opportunity of partnering with the city to uh, to maintain these spaces, to use them um, as play space for gardening, outdoor furniture. So kind of the biggest things is they can't put buildings on them. They can't put paved areas on them. Those are kind of big no nos. <clears throat> All right, so last slide. Um, so kind of next steps, just to summarize, these are things that I've already pointed out is, is coming up next week. Uh, council will be um, requested to approve purchase of the two properties with FEMA grant funding. And then we will work towards demolition within 90 days of closing. And as I said, again, we're trying to work with FEMA to see is there a possibility to actually relocate those homes um, or salvage from the homes so they don't just go to the landfill. Uh, so we're still working on that. Uh, this summer, we'll start the historic consultation process after we get feedback from y'all on that open space use plan. And then the hope is, you know, this late summer, early fall is to actually issue that notice of sale uh, to look for a developer to redevelop these sites. So with that, um, here is my contact information and we will take questions. And, and as I said, again, we will be sending out uh, the link to the recording after the meeting and the draft notice of sale document so everyone can take a look at them. And if y'all could provide feedback by next Friday, uh, that would really help us in terms of, I wanna make sure that everyone has time to look at the information and provide us feedback, um, just because you know, I spent over 30 minutes on that presentation. So, okay. I think Lynn is gonna help me with the questions, but I know Ms. Erin has had her hand up for a long time. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, really great overview. Um, this is really the first time that I've been exposed to it and uh, just kudos to you because that was a lot of information to get through. Uh, so I actually think that the 33 minutes was spot on. Um, oh, you. you know, uh, just a couple of questions. So I'm at 2020 Carleton. Um, so I'm, we're very familiar with uh, the Bryce uh, area retention mm -hmm. pond. Um, that has not been a value add per se to the neighborhood. Um, and especially, um, you know, uh, like, even I know that the city maintains it, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily the most aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing. But we've also had problems with um, loiterers, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of concerns there. So I'm really delighted to hear that it sounds like the city's first priority is to resell these houses. Mm -hmm. Um, and so just a couple of quick questions like that. So, yes, getting the, it, it, this isn't something that we would sell at now an apartment, apartment complex could be built. Okay. No, no. Yeah. So that's one of the requirements is it's got to stay a single family, single unit. not okay. replatting the lots. Perfect. Um, second, you know, um, the appraisal effect, um, you know, uh, I know that this is probably a question that many of the other homeowners in this area have. Our taxes went up significantly. Uh, and I'm just wondering how, you know, I like, it's, it's a little bit of a struggle, you know, when we're looking at this and we're acknowledging that the appraisals for many houses, nine houses in our area are going down, ours are going up, doesn't, doesn't feel right. And I'm, I'm wondering how that those appraisals are gonna affect our home values. And frankly, like, do we, do we need a tax break considering the fact that this is happening literally in our backyards? So in terms of the appraisal that we're going to do or the appraisals that we have done to purchase the nine properties? I would say the appraisals that you're going to do and the appraisals, it just doesn't, I guess um, this is a, a, I'm sorry for not being very articulate with my question. It doesn't make sense that we're recognizing that these houses are of lower value and yet our values are increasing when there's significant burden associated with rebuilding this area. Something's not adding up. So the appraisal that we're going to be doing so it will value these properties lower because it's going to take into effect, uh, into account the fact that a developer is gonna have to come in and they're gonna have to either take those existing homes and pay to elevate them. They're gonna have to pay to bring them up to city standards um, or they're gonna have to tear them down and then they're gonna have to rebuild a very new home to city standards. Yep. 
and it's got to comply with that whole list of regulations and totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I totally get that. And so that's it. They're, they're buying it at a discount basically, because of course I just, right. I think that it, it really needs to be said that the, the, you know, um, I I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, weary about our appraisal going up and the potential for this actually to sink our home values in the long run. Bert, I see you kind of moving around over there, but before I know that I probably won't be able to ask any other uh, questions. The only other concern I noted was when, when we say anything like maintained by those uh, homeowners, um, that is such a wild card and you could have somebody as delightful as my neighbor Bert or Guy who like does a beautiful job with their garden or you could have not that. Right, so I just would really consider that last but not least Jennifer again. Thank you so much. And I'd really like to be part of any community group or um, lend my support because we're, we're here for the long run. We've got 2 little kids. We're not planning on moving. We love this neighborhood and I just want to support you guys. Um, however, we can. So thank you and I'll and I'll shut thank up. You. Now. Thank you. No, thank you. Good feedback. So, Linda, I don't know who's next. Have you been keeping track at all? We had one in the chat. I yeah, I can't hear Linda, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, and I, I see a woman, Carrie Richards. Yeah. yeah. Carrie Richards asked the question that she lives next door, I think, to some of these lots, and no one told her about uh, the flood risk and why did why did the people why are we advising these people and she didn't find out about it. No. So I I, so, hi, I'm Carrie. Um, so I bought the house at 2208 Carlton and the other day when I met Bert is the first I've heard about this. No one told me it didn't come up in any documents during the purchase. This is the first home I ever bought. And now I'm finding out that the three houses next to me are going to be demolished. They're probably going to be taller than my house. They're going to be, I, I just, I don't know what they're going to do to my house. I, I don't want to live through however, you know, 30 months of construction. It just, this is all news to me and I just am appalled that I didn't know, like, it's just, and, and I've spent, I bought the house a year ago and I've been working on it for eight months. It was supposed to take four and I moved in two weeks ago. And this is the first I've heard about any of this. Right. Yeah. I can definitely see um, lots of times when people buy properties, um, the disclosure documents really focus on the FEMA floodplains. And, and so this is not a FEMA floodplain that goes through the area. Uh, kind of, as I mentioned, it's a lot really due to that undersized storm drain infrastructure. So I will say um, in the future is that the city is working towards um, trying to make our maps for these flood prone areas readily available to the public. So right now, um, people can actually go on a one address Fort Worth website. They could type in an address. And it will actually say if there's a um, FEMA floodplain or if there's potential for high water on a property, which is specifically um, the situation that we're talking about here. So this non-FEMA flooding. So that information is already out there right now. Um, and we're trying to make that information even more widely available um, and trying to regulate small lot development in this area so it is not um, aggravating flood risk to existing residents. And so there's actually going to be um, action taken to council in June, um, focused on updating our, our stormwater regulations to, uh, to better regulate these areas for small lot development, specifically, just like what we're talking about in Arlington Heights. And then we will also be rolling out maps on the website. So people understand that this flood risk is out there. So, unfortunately. You are not the first one um, who has said they've experienced something just like this. Um, unfortunately, we hear it before, and that's why we're trying to work towards this effort so people um, are warned before they can make that purchase and can take that into consideration when they take well, when they make. But well, what about me? I wasn't. So what do I do going forward? Like, and like, this is that little white house is next door to me, literally. So I don't know what it's going to do to my property. I don't know what it's going to do to my property value. I don't want to live through 30 months of construction. I moved here because it was quiet, you know? I mean, so I, I will probably have to meet with you separately, but I really don't know what I'm supposed to do with this information, just getting it now. This is something anyone buying in this neighborhood has a right to know. So what I'd like to know is if the city sent out notices to owners 
in this neighborhood, if anything was sent to people informing them, because if it was, it should have been disclosed to me and it wasn't because I never would have bought this house. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to talk with you uh, separately. So That's we'll start a call, Carrie. Okay, because I, because I, I don't know what I'm going to do with my situation here. I, I'm not living through 30 months of construction, so we'll have to figure out some an option. Hey, Jennifer, uh, Nick Rich, uh, thank you again for putting that together. You did a good job. Um, question I have is, <clears throat> as far as the elevated structures are concerned, um, has Friesen Nichols been able to do any sort of modeling to try and mimic to the best of their ability what a race structure will do to the flow of water and how it, by raising the structures, how it actually helps mitigate the flood risk to people downstream, not necessarily the homes that are elevated, but people that are further downstream because the water's got to go somewhere and it's going to back up somewhere. And if the structures are elevated um, and there's less uh, objects or less structures uh, in the way to stop the water or stop the flow, I should say, um, you know, it's still got to go. So it's still got to go somewhere. So I just didn't know if, you know, since Freeze Nichols is at at, at y'all's disposal from an engineering perspective, what they're modeling or you know what they've they viewed on that. Yes, let me let me yes, let me there. let me jump in there. Uh, so the this bottom home right here. So so you won't see homes up on piers with the water able to flow through quickly um, because that would actually then flood people downstream. Um, so they're, they've got to be homes. And so just taking the home that's there right now today and elevating it, it it's not going to have any benefits um, to, to flooding or it's not going to have any negative impacts on flooding either. So you're basically just taking that home, you're elevating it up. So water will still then hit that bottom surface around it. So Freesa Nichols has taken a look. Um, and they say that this can be done without aggravating existing flood risks. Uh, leaving the fencing is really important. Is there anyone from, from Freeze that just wants to jump in there, just kind of from an engineering perspective and say anything about that? Yeah, I just would reiterate, Jennifer, what we found in the, the modeling is the fences are the controlling factor in the hydraulics for a lot of these. So as long as we maintain the fencing, um, we believe that the flow after the Project is over would be very similar. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you guys. So if I understood him correctly, he said the flow would still be similar. It would not mitigate the um uh, wouldn't lessen the flood potential. The flood potential is still gonna be there. It's yes. just that yeah, water's not gonna be entering people's homes. Yes, yeah. This project, yes. yeah, this project, yes. the redevelopment okay. project does nothing to mitigate home risk or flood risk to other other homes. All it does is take those existing ground zero flood prone homes and elevate them up about two feet above the base flood elevation. And so so that was initially just kind of going. Oh. So that was like we wanted to do green space and detention. Um, for all of these homes, it would just be another little piece, just kind of like the other detention basin. But because of the community concern about, um, you know, the green space and unwanted uses in the green space, that's why we have now turned to the redevelopment concept. So it was really because of the community uh, concern. Jennifer, we got another question from Bart Wilhelm, uh, the builder that wins the bid for the property. What kind of project will they be building? Other houses? Yes, yeah, they have to be single family residential homes. Yes. That fit the whole character of the community. I see Ms. Richards, you got your hand back up. Maybe, maybe it just never went down. I don't know. Okay. And, and this is Sandy Will. I just wanted to add to that question. Um, so there won't be any of the, the two senior properties were actually duplexes. So these will all be single family. And then, and again, I apologize, this may be known to others, but, um, and then the 
the neighborhood group that's working with you will have input on uh, the the look and the feel and and that kind of thing to the um, homes that they'll be putting in. So yes, single family. Um, and right now, the notice of sale, the guidelines and restrictions we have put together are all based off of the feedback that the neighborhood leadership provided to us a couple years ago. So very. Uh, very specific on what they want to see in y'all's neighborhood. They want it to look very uniform to what's there today. Um, and so, so I know Christina Patowski, I know a lot of y'all know her. She's been working uh, with us for several years on this. And so we've been really listening and she's been conveying community feedback through her uh, to us to help us put this together. And, and Jennifer, um, how do we get onto this community group? Uh, so when the RFP comes back from the notice of sale, um, how do we get on that group for the community uh, to uh, evaluate it, uh, understand you guys' criteria, and also I want to uh, kind of get an idea of where will this be posted, when will it be posted? Right. So in terms of how we get on the group, um, I'll probably you know work with uh, Christina just as a long-term um, leader for y'all's neighborhood and figure out how to work. Um, you know, get that group together. I'm really going to kind of uh, focus on. Christina, helping me get those right residents that live closest to those homes on that group. Um, so, so definitely. And then in terms of, you know, how it'll be advertised, we're really trying to, to look at the options available to us. We want this to go out. We want people to see it. We know it's going to be a unique project and not just like every random builder is going to bid. So, um, so we're open. If y'all have got ideas or, you know, people, we want people to share it when it goes out. Uh, we're, we're trying to post it for a long enough time so people can really have a chance to think about it and look at it. Um, and when we have that pre-bid meeting, it might come up, hey, you know, this is not enough time for a developer. And so we'll be listening during that pre-bid meeting and potentially, you know, we could have, you know, an extension or, you know, trying to answer questions to see. We really want this to be successful for the development community and for your neighborhood. Awesome. Uh, and one more question. Uh, well, how's the communication for this RFP going to get out or any other updates, uh, you know, with this? Is that going to get, do we need to be on an email ad, uh, distribution list or how does it, you know, how do we understand when the next steps are going to be, especially the RFP and all that good stuff? Right, right. So I think probably what we can do is, is I know Linda's done a good job, like getting everyone's emails to get y'all um, the, uh, the calendar and everything for y'all to participate. So we can start an email list through that. And then of course, work through the neighborhood leadership and they can promote it out through their leader leadership. And we can keep y'all up to date as like, when we go get ready to issue and when the bids come in. So, um, so we're happy to keep y'all as we actually start to move forward. I know we've kind of been in that like acquisition mode. Um, but, but we have been working with Christina over the last few years and giving her updates as we have acquired them. But, uh, but we're happy to be a little more, more active as we actually start to move forward into this. All right, thank you. I'll yield to the others. We've got yeah, Emily. We have... Sorry, what? Uh, we have a question from Emily Baxter at 2121 Western. Uh, she says, we under... she understands that we're looking for one developer are those of us adjacent able to purchase part or all of the lot next door to us? So, uh, so no, right now we're, we're looking for one developer, um, but, but if there are people who are interested in actually acquiring one of those either elevated or newly built homes, then we will put you in contact with the developer. We can give that developer your name. Um, and then they could reach out and maybe y'all could work together to, you know, say, hey, I want one of these houses, you know, built how I want it. So, uh, so we're willing to definitely put you in contact with that future developer. And, and Matt, did we answer your questions? I believe so. Richards has a few more questions. Um, one of which is with the new homes. Cause more flooding to existing homes since the roof, but ours next door would not. So you broke and carries the one. Sorry, you broke up. Did you hear, can you hear me, Jennifer? Yes. Yeah. So the, the question is, is whether the new homes will cause more flooding to existing homes because the new homes are going to be flood proof. 
but theirs are not. So no, so that that's a, a big, we do not want to cause more flooding to the existing residents. And so that's why um, I had that slide earlier, you know, we'll really wanna make sure that they're looking at the grading, that those fences remain in place, that they're not adding a whole bunch of impervious surface when it's not there today or they're offsetting it. So we don't want someone to take that smaller house footprint and then suddenly decide to pave the whole backyard. So that could have impacts. So we'll be looking at all those types of things when we review the plans for these properties before they're approved, because we do not want the new homes to aggravate the existing flooding. And then Carrie had one other question, uh, so we'll get hers is, will the city reimburse any property loss of value that harms homeowners as a result of the project? Again, iterating that she was not informed prior to purchasing, but should have been about this project. So I will, um, I'll say no to that, but I will say that we, uh, we work really hard with the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Association to keep uh, residents up to speed on, on what we're doing in the neighborhood. Um, I know the city does projects all over the community, all over the city, and we we issue public meetings. Uh, so city projects, um, they're not uh, they're not rare. They happen all over. Um, but we're really going to work to make this project successful. We want the developer to um, one of the actually in that um, notice of sale documents. We say we want them to be um, keeping the community up to speed on what's going on. And we don't want the construction to go on forever. That's why we have a, a restriction of that it's got to be complete within 30 months. So hopefully it doesn't take uh, because I think a lot of that is going to be, you know, they're planning. They're going to have to put together their plan. Um, but we also knew too, uh, based off the uh, the market how it is today, uh, th materials and so forth. Um, there's supply shortages. So we wanted to make sure that there was time to actually have a viable uh, development plan. Uh, so we don't have to go to that green space and detention concept because we know that the community would rather see these homes elevated. And I'll add on to that, Carrie, too. The city does have a process. If you if you believe that you've been damaged in some way due to something the city is responsible for, there is a way you can file a claim with the city and it's reviewed by the legal team to see if the city has any liability. So I know Jennifer was going to talk to you follow up and we'd be happy to provide you all the information on how to file that claim. So yeah. Then I, I don't think we did answer all of Matt's questions. He asked, has the city considered removing the homes and leaving the property as at grade green space strategically place fencing in the open space could help manage flow? I mean, we did kind of, but I think he asked the question after you described the green space options. So you might want to reiterate on that, Jennifer. Right, so uh, so what we talked about is that if if we left it as green space, so if the if the notice of sale we don't get a viable bidder and we go back to the green space concept, uh, we would go and create a stormwater mm -hmm. detention basin in that area because initially the whole purpose of the project was one to mitigate the flooding of these homes at ground zero that repetitively flooded, and then two, we would like to the rest of the the neighborhood downstream to benefit from the detention we you know as i as i said there's a lot of stormwater running through this area so as much detention as that we can get we're really trying to protect more than just those structures that we bought um so we would work really closely with the community i know um in october 2018 we kind of threw up some design concepts in that meeting and so we'd probably start with those and sit down uh, with a small working group of community members and really try to figure out you know what is the best design concept um, so it doesn't, um, you know, you've got clear sight lines, so it doesn't like encourage people to hide in the basin or things like that. So we would take all of that into account when when designing the concept. Yeah. Hey, mm -hmm. Jennifer, this Deals is Matt. Too. If I can expand a little bit on that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So understanding that, but I guess the way I look at it, if we put in raised structures, which, you know, I understand the city wants to develop it if possible. Um, you know, we're not improving the downstream condition for downstream residents in that situation. We're just putting new homes that it may be out of place. So that's why I didn't know if I can invent it. If it, the critical part isn't creating more detention because it's not going to solve the problem, just help mitigate some smaller items. You know, have we considered just that at grade park area that's more useful for local residents as opposed to, you know, an actual base? And I think the residents, um, up here at the corner on Carlton and Bryce mentioned like the current basin across from Walgreens isn't really useful for the area. 
So I'm not sure a basin in the middle of the, the middle of the neighborhood is actually that useful either. And an at-grade option may be more more useful or beneficial. So we would have to to look at it to evaluate the impact of an at-grade, like it really wouldn't be a basin, just an at-grade green space on uh, on the homes downstream. So so one, yes, uh, Freesa Nichols has said those fences need to be in place. So you would just have these fences, you'd have these open lots, um, but suddenly those homes wouldn't be there anymore. And so right. you know, the fences are there, the homes are also slowing down that water. So that might not be feasible. Uh, when we looked at this in the past, we evaluated putting in a basin and putting in a basin definitely you know, didn't have downstream impacts and actually had those benefits to the residents downstream. Another thing is, um, you know, as we would form a small group, we really, you know, would work with y'all on, you know, how can we make this basin a valuable multi-use basin? You know, what what do you want to see there? What do you want the look to be? Um, so that's something that we would work with y'all on. Okay, a few more things here. We're kind of running out of time, so let's try. And uh, Carrie, also, I don't know if you can see the chat, Carrie, but Needles Brown from our real property division has also put in an, a website link for the Texas, I guess it's real estate commission. And his point is, is that your real estate agent could potentially be a liable prop party if in fact they should have disclosed this to you and did not. So that might be another route you want to go. Um, well, the problem is you can't really prove that, you know, proving that they knew is really difficult. You know, like how right. do you prove that they knew? So, yeah, no, um, I understand. So that's that's sort of the thing. But the thing is, you know, I mean, there should have been notices or something. I mean, the owner of my property was disabled. She was, you know, not totally with it. Her kids were kind of, you know, running the property, but not really staying here. So like it, it she needed a higher touch to be informed of what was going on than your average person. So, right. I mean, my agent will just say that she didn't know. So, but I appreciate you posting that, but that's what she's going to say. I understand. Um, Grant, you've had your hand up a couple of times. I want to give you a chance. Uh, am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. We okay. can hear you. Yes. So I'm just going back to that last statement about calling Trek and blaming a real estate agent. So I've been living here since August of last year and I'm on Western. I'm right, I'm right on the corner of Bryce and Western. I live right by the, the flood basin. And I had no clue about this for months. Um, I, my neighbor, we're doing a little watch party here. My neighbor, Steve, who lives right next door, who used to own some property on right there on Bryce that the city had bought from to turn into the basin. He's the one who ended up telling me two or three months, I would say, into this project after I met, of rehabbing this house after I met him, that this street floods, um, which who would think in the middle of Arlington Heights a street would flood? So I'm just trying to say that it's not gonna be the real estate agent's fault that helped you pick a house. Um, this is a, a problem that's been going on for a hundred years, hundreds of years that nobody really knows about unless you lived here and through it. Um, Steve has been here 17 years and you can't see him. He's right off to my side and he has seen this street flood several times. So to blame a real estate agent doesn't make sense because it's just another person who's just doing their best to find a house for, for other people. So don't blame the real estate agent on this. Um, the original homeowner who had been here for a while would know about things flooding, but not the agent that helped buy the house. I just wanted to throw that out there. No, that's a good point. Thank you, thank you. And I do- And the city, and the city. Here. I, I do wanna throw this back up here real quick, just showing, you know, the flooding is pretty isolated, right? You know, kind of following that storm drain system. And so, so if you, you know, if you don't live, you know, real close to that area, you might not ever see the flooding. So I just throw that out there. Yeah, and again, the grants point, Jennifer went over it before. <clears throat> we recognize the issue with there being flood prone areas that are not in FEMA flood maps. And that's actually something, you know, that we are really trying to actively uh, mitigate that risk there by communicating that much more, you know, 
openly so people do are aware of that. But that again, that's a problem nationwide. The a lot of the a lot of the most highly flood prone areas all across the country are not in FEMA floodplain maps and getting the word out on the risk there is a big challenge. So we got one more question in the chat. Bird asked, is the city planning to purchase two more homes to bring the home count to nine and which home? So Jennifer, if you could clarify the number of houses and what we've done and what we're doing. All right, so, uh, so this map here on the screen. So we have purchased nine properties so far. Those are the ones in blue. And then we're only purchasing two more properties. These ones kind of with the green dashed line on them through the FEMA grant. So the two through the FEMA grant will be going to council next week. All the blue ones have already been purchased. Uh, we are not planning to purchase any more properties in this area. Okay. That is the last of the questions in the chat and I don't see any more hands. So Jennifer, you wanna, oh, I do see another. Carrie, do you have another question? Your hand's still up or is we, uh, just didn't come down from last time? No, it didn't come down, but I would sell my property if you decide you'll do one more because I don't wanna deal with any of this. I'll just move to Weatherford. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll follow up with you, Carrie, after that. I understand that's, that's a difficult situation. Nick, I see your hand. I don't know if that's an old hand or a new hand. No, it's 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 a new one. Um, I just I go back to you know raising the structures doesn't mitigate the flooding and it still has to travel downhill. If this is a good map across the house that's across from the, the on the Carlton. Um, and for everybody that does that's on the chat that doesn't know me, I'm Nick Rich. I'm at 2209 Carlton. I'm across the street from Cary. And Carrie, I'll be happy to talk to you about this at a later date. But uh, right across the street from the 22, uh, 2224 and the 2300 on Carlton, if you go back to that one property or that one slide, uh, Jennifer, that's got uh, the map that shows the, the flood plane with, uh, with the pipe. Um, this one? So, yeah, they're perfect. So. The, that, that top photo is a good representation of what happens on Carlton. Obviously, the bottom photo is Western. Um, so those two properties that I mentioned across from the 2224 and the 2300, the yellow house and uh, the one next door, those houses flood as well. And uh, I know that those weren't initially on the uh, docket to be purchased, but they're impacted by this too. And so by raising, raising structures, I just want to point out that it doesn't mitigate, it doesn't slow down the flow of water. The, the flow, the water volume is still going to be there. There's still going to be a lake every five, six, seven years on Carlton and on Western. And so I think that, you know, I brought this up in, in a previous, uh, previous call, but uh, those two FEMA houses with the house that the city owns in the middle, um, I honestly think that those, that, that needs to be another retention area, similar to the one that's on Walgreens. I don't like the one across from Walgreens, just like everybody else. But, you know, like I brought up in the previous, uh, call, uh, you know, we could put a fence across that and no one would be any, any wiser that there's a detention pond there. Um, that should in conjunction with the one across from Walgreens at least slow the volume of water down as it heads downstream and allow for the system underneath the ground, the pipes to catch up and relieve that water so that the people that are downstream from these houses that the city owns aren't impacted as severely as they are right now. So, so, so Nick, I, I don't really have a question. I don't really have a question. It's more of a comment. I just want to throw that out there again as a, you know, as a consideration. I know that, you know, you showed the slide that kept that house there, but really we got to figure out how to, we're putting a bandaid on a bad situation right now. So let's put a, an, an even bigger bandage on it and try and slow down the volume of water. If we can't solve the problem, which we all know what, the only way to solve the problem is to dig a pipe underneath I-30 and get it to the Trinity River, which is going to cost 60, 70, 80 million dollars on the low end. So, so, uh, so Nick, I was going to say uh, that I, I asked Frieza Nichols uh, after you asked that question a couple of weeks ago, you know, how much more detention could we get if we took the two FEMA and that one between them? And they said, 
you know, y'all like correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, it was like less than an acre foot. Uh, so very, very small amount, but you know, every small amount does help. And that, that was our whole plan to begin with to put in the detention because Residents right now say that the detention that's in there right now at Healing and Bryce and the understreet detention, they say that it makes a difference. And so even though it's small, those most frequent events, you know, it's another little bit um, of help for those downstream. So, but it's, it's still very small. And Jennifer, I'd like to also add to that. And I'm sorry, I won't take any more anybody's any more time and I'm sorry, but uh, Western has the underground detention Ashland has the underground detention. When I bought my house in 2015, we redid all the utilities on Carlton, repaved Carlton, but the city ran out of money for the underground detention that initially Theresa Nichols also wanted to put in in Carlton so that when water did get all the way through and got down into Carlton, that it had somewhere to you know, to slow it down and store it until the system could catch up. So I want to add to the two FEMA houses and the house that, you know, is in the middle that the city owns, call it a wash. You make that a detention pond and then you put the detention, the same detention system at the end of Carlton that's similar to Ashland and similar to Western. And that'll add even more protection to help relieve the pressure of the system. And and Nick, I believe uh, Frisa Nichols can and tell me if I'm wrong or right, but I believe that they did evaluate the Carlton detention and it was determined that once Western and Ashland was in place, it didn't have any meaningful benefit uh, based off how the system works. It's, can y'all talk about that? I know it's been a while. Yeah, you're right, Jennifer. We did evaluate um, underground detention in Carlton we actually looked at underground attention through a number of streets across the watershed and it, it's kind of the same story. Every little bit helps, but only to, you know, a little bit. Okay. So just a little bit more. Yeah. yeah and it wasn't Nick, it wasn't a matter of us running out of money. Uh, I mean, I guess in a sense you could look at it that way, but it's a matter of, you know, benefit cost and with the resources we have with all the needs across the city, trying to provide the best benefit we can. Uh, again, the, the level of benefit that would be received, you know, compared to the cost, you know, it just wasn't as big as much bang for the buck as we could get in other parts of the city for other needs. And so that was the decision there was to take it out of to not do that in Carlton. So. Yeah, I'll echo what Greg said. It is the underground attention is a very expensive, you know, per unit cost in terms of the, the storage you get. There any no, other? understood. And understood. And hey, that, that maybe that was an unnecessary comment that was not directed at either one of you, just so you, you guys are aware. So, or, or, or even Freese and Nichols for that point. But yeah, I just yeah. would be interested. Be, I'd be interested in seeing what the modeling, you know, an updated modeling looks like when you put those factors into place, like I, like I outlined or mentioned. I think I don't see any other questions, Greg, Linda, now. I don't see any others and we're 15 minutes over our stated time. I know a few, quite a few people have already left, but um, so yeah, I guess we ought to go ahead and wrap Jennifer. If you want. Okay. Well, uh, well, thank you all. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to stop the recording uh, before I forget and hold on. So what,